Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today I have a very fun, amazing, and inspiring woman with me today. We we met at, um, of course, you guys hear me all the time talking about Goldman Sachs and what we learned there. This is one of my fellow scholars, Lydia Hi. Michael. She is a speaker, an entrepreneur, a brand owner, a world traveler. Uh, she is everything, and I just can't wait to introduce you to her and uh, you get to know her a little bit as well too because I've had such a joy getting to know her and how she does business and how she does all of the things and so um welcome Lydia thanks for being here hi Kristen I'm so excited to be here thanks for having me yeah and it's so good to see you again I know we've saw each other here and there at different things but it's so nice to see you here again and I'm I know coming up in a few weeks we're probably gonna meet again so I'm just excited about that we make lifelong friends at uh Goldman Sachs 10,000 small businesses program uh, we spend 14 weeks intensively together uh building businesses giving each other feedback doing hard things there was laughing there was crying there was frustration there was everything everything um and so that really builds a bond and a connection so no matter where you are in the world or what you're doing or what type of businesses which we do very different things um there's still this sisterhood and bond when you spend that much time with someone doing something that you equally care about and it's business and so that's really something that we've connected on and i just um i know we share that mutual connection with with education and that's why we kind of signed up for that so tell me a little bit about like the 10ksb and why you chose to apply there and ended up with with us in there together yeah. So, you know, five years into the business, I felt like it was the right time to sign up for that program to really help not only myself just on an individual level, but also on a professional level evolve and take that next stage of growth. And I know that that looks different for everybody and especially depending on the industry that you're in, right. And everybody that was in our cohort, but I felt like that was the right time for me to sort of commit and work more on my business instead of just working in my business, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, we talked about that a lot. I think that was the theme of the program is I'm going to learn how to work more on my business and not just in my business. Right. And I love how Kent was always talking about like being like the, the behind the clerk at seven 11, like you're the owner, but you're running yeah. the cash register. And I got it like cleaning the Slurpee machine. You know, it's like, you're the owner, but like you really have to learn how to, like you said, I think it's like more like growing up, like realizing yeah. like I'm committed to the growth of this business and I'm mm -hmm. committed to the growth of myself and wanting to see it through. And one of the things, I feel like I was challenged a lot in in 10 KSB was um to and I'm I wrote a book called Dream Big, right? But they challenged yeah. me even there to dream bigger than even what I was thinking of. I remember one of those first couple modules when we had to like, you know, me with all my colors and markers and had to draw pictures and stuff. But like, we yeah. had to really be like, okay, here's 50,000. Here's 500,000. Here's $5 million. What are you gonna you do were the 5 million. Per I remember you because you said 5 milli. <laughs> yeah, I did. Remember that? I drew, I still have that picture that I drew with all those markers in do the little you? world and stuff. Yeah, and it's funny because that was, that was really challenging to really think yeah. even bigger. I thought I was thinking big already. And they're like, just kidding. No, you're not and i was like oh wow and so that was a super challenge for me um oh yeah and okay so i know i didn't introduce your business on purpose because i wanted to you to build us a little journey there so um obviously being an entrepreneur um now but were you always an entrepreneur like how did your career start like take me through a little bit of college and then what you ended up because i know you've you've been everywhere and done a lot of things and then how yeah. you ended up to um of course your amazing business that you'll introduce to us at the end of your journey here <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So it's funny when you say, or when you ask, have you always been an entrepreneur? So I wasn't, but in my mind, I always felt like I was, and it was really part of my personality and DNA. So even when I was working my jobs, mm -hmm. I was so committed to the growth of that company. I was doing everything I could 24 seven to help make that business, help make the product or the brand better than it was than when I had joined, right? And so I think that there's a mindset that you have as an entrepreneur um, that comes with that level of commitment and determination and growth and um, all of those different characteristics that you might not have if you're not an entrepreneur, right? And so going back to when I started, um, I know you said college, so um, that was 
years back. I'm not going to date myself. <laughs> yeah. Don't, you don't have to dig but, that far back. We won't have to talk about dates or whatever. But yeah. <laughs> so, you know, originally I'm from Germany. I was born and raised there. And then I came to the U S and I went to college here. So I went to Wayne state university in Detroit and I studied marketing management. And the reason why I wanted to study marketing management at the time is because prior to that, I actually always wanted to study psychology. Mm -hmm. And there was a shift in my decision because I really was interested in business. And I felt like marketing was the perfect balance between the world of psychology and business um, and sort of that consumer behavior and understanding the mind of the customer and you know how they tick and what works and all of those things. And I felt like marketing was really the space for me. And in hindsight, I, I don't regret that decision. So I spent four years, almost four years at Wayne State um, I did that and then really wanted to jump into my MBA right after that. And so that was sort of the path that I had envisioned for myself at the time. And as you probably know, as an entrepreneur and a business owner, a lot of times when you set those plans, they don't always happen <laughs> the way you envision them. And so I was doing an internship uh, with the Detroit Jazz Festival in my last semester of college. And during that time, I connected with um, people in the music industry who had an opening for a job that was sort of in the marketing space, but it was music and entertainment. And I sort of just naturally connected with them and started working in that space. And I was like, ah, oh, school can wait. It's always going to be there, <laughs> um, you know, and, and started there. And I ended up spending five years in that space, working with artists and managers and helping um brand and market musicians all over the world. So it was really in the international marketing space, but I also was handling the operations of the business, the day-to-day -day -day operations. And so it was a combination of both of those worlds and really helping build a company and brands up from the ground. And I think that's where a lot of my creativity comes from. I think that that's where a lot of that, that hustle and the entrepreneurship and that determination really I had a chance to explore all of those sides of, of who I am and who I wanted to be in those five years. And that sort of laid a really healthy foundation for what I, what I wanted to do. Right. So it was marketing essentially, but it was in, in different industries. So um, it wasn't entrepreneurship, you know, in terms of me taking the risk and me cutting the check and me calling the shots. Right. I yes. mean, there was somebody else I had to report yeah. to, but <laughs> In a way, I felt like I was getting all of the training and, and I was indirectly getting that MBA that I wanted to do at the time mm -hmm. through practical work, through training, through the, um, hands the on, actual work, hands-on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I did that. And then there was a you know another side of me that's always been intri um, intrigued by, by culture. And so I had a small side business, which I guess that would be my first entrepreneurial um, venture at the time. Uh, was a cultural and linguistic company where we would provide uh, services to automotive expatriates. Mm. So anybody that was coming from abroad to the U.S. or leaving the U.S., going to another country, helping them understand how culture and how business operates in that country. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was focused, you know, on, on U.S. culture with people coming here, but they were coming from all over the place. Um, so people coming from China and Japan and Germany and Italy and France and helping them understand mm. how they can adapt to the culture, but in a business setting, right? That is so, amazing and so needed because yeah. you know, I can't imagine walking into a different country in the way they do business. Even think about tipping, for example. Like that's yeah, something how I do you always tip a different culture. Culture, yeah, it's right? just a Some different ways. culture to where you know, like my my mom was uh, a server at a fine dining restaurant for many years before she joined me in my business, and she would notice the cultural differences of people who come here and, and learn, like, oh, why don't the, these types of people or these people from this country or whatever they don't tip and then people realize oh because they're paid a full wage in their country to do yeah. that job rather than relying on tips as the income so simple things like that and even in business and practices and how people interact before they start negotiations for example is so different in cultures so that's such a needed um resource and education line yeah for that. yeah yeah so that that was the, the first small business really that that i was running at the time and then as I had reached the five-year mark with the music business that I was working in, 
I decided to actually go back to my hometown to Germany and uh, really decided to go back to school. So the MBA that I wanted to do five years prior to that set a goal for myself to go back to Germany and do it there, partially because I miss being home and I wanted to have a different experience. I never felt like I had the chance to to be an adult in my own hometown, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. I was young coming here to the US and I felt like there was still so much potential that I could explore in my own country, you know, going back. And so um, what seems to maybe have been a little impulsive, you know, mm -hmm. I, I left my previous job and I really didn't have a guarantee that I had even gotten into that school when I left. Mm -hmm. And I committed all of my time to studying for the GMAT at the time. And I pretended like that was my full-time gig. Um, and it, it worked out, you know, after a few tries, um, it worked out. And three months later I was in Germany and I wake up and I think to myself, this is crazy. <laughs> You know, where, where, where was I last week? Where am I right now? And so this whole new journey started of being back in my hometown, and even culturally, you know, that's always been throughout my journey, whether it was business ownership or just even personally, there's always been this um, involvement of culture, right? The culture has always played a really big part of my life. And culturally, my background is Middle Eastern. So my parents are from Iraq. And so there's always been a lot of cultural influences in my life. And even when I went back to Germany, there was a culture shock that I experienced because I had been away for a little over two to uh, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so even just having to get adjusted to that culture, which a lot of my friends at the time didn't understand. And they were like, what do you mean you're from here? Like, you should know this. And this, you know, this is where you're from. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, this. Well, is just, let's talk no. about that for a minute. I find that so interesting, right? Because you came to the U.S. as a young adult, right? Like to yes. go to school and making that adjustment. So talk about a little bit of that, because this really plays into Blended Collective and what you've built as a business in all yeah. this different culture and diversity coming from, um, from you know, the background and the heritage and nationality that you have, then coming here, then going back there and then coming back here, you know, that's really yeah. interesting. And the different, like you said, a decade can make yeah. a difference in being away from like your home. So what was your culture shock when you came here as a young, you know, fresh coming to like America? What was some differences that you noticed right away? You know, the, the biggest difference, and there were so many, mm -hmm. because Europe is just, it's just so different than, um, than the US. But Coming here, I had to do my last year of high school in the States, actually. And so the biggest comparison that I kept drawing is how different high school was in Germany and how different it was here in the U.S., right? And so getting adjusted to that in my senior year where everybody's already connected and you have all these little clicks and, you know, here I am, the, the, the girl from Germany, <laughs> um, you know, trying to join the mix. But that to me was a big culture shock just in terms of... Um, the whole school system, you know, the what was uh, the education. main difference that you noticed? I would say even the system in terms of how, you know, so the German schools are very structured in the sense that you have specific classes that you take with the same group of people from fifth grade all the way through graduation, which at the time was, you know, 13 years mm -hmm. of high school yeah. that changed to 12 um, over the years. But, you know, you sort of grow with that same group of people all those years and you have all these different classes and there's a few different selectives or select um, electives mm -hmm. um, that you take that are still sort of in that space of straightforward education. What's not straightforward to me at the time when I came to the U.S. were the classes that you could take that were so creative in terms of like studying psych, you know, psychology. I took a psychology class when I came here and I was in high school. You, we don't have that in Germany. You can't mm. take those classes to see if that's even a career path that you want to take, right? Mm. Um, sort of from that level, the type of classes, the education was different, but also just that you're thrown into a class with freshmen and senior and juniors <laughs> and sophomores and kind of everybody, mm. um, even though everybody's on a different level of, of education, if you will, right? Yeah. And so that I think was one of the biggest, um, biggest differences and just how everything's done. I mean, I remember being in a math class and I was like, well, this is how I got my solution. And the teacher's like, well, you know, this is how we do it. Can you please show us your solution? Because this is not how we do it, but you've got the right answer. So, right. um, you know, you're obviously right. And so that I think 
even just looking back from an entrepreneur um, perspective is there's so many different ways to doing things. Absolutely. Right. And you can get to the same path using a lot of different methods, but that doesn't mean that it's incorrect. Right. And we see that in entrepreneurship all the time. I mean, things that we don't really know the answer to sometimes we just trial and error and it's figuring out things and we see what works and what doesn't work. And we do more of what works. Right. Um, as long as we keep our eye on that North star and that destination that we want to get to. Right. Yeah. So let's blend this into your current business now. So you had this little journey, you've gone back and forth uh, across the pond, I call it, um, yeah. into different cultures and which leads to now, which is blended collective. Now tell everybody what blended collective is and what you do there. And we'll get into why this all weaves together. Yeah, it's my baby. <laughs> So Blenda Collective is a multicultural marketing and brand consultancy. And when we work with businesses, we basically help them enrich their marketing efforts through culture and emotion. So we're built on the pillars of authenticity, culture, and diversity. So services, for instance, that, that we offer is anything from doing the brand development where we help brands really understand who they are at the foundation helping them develop their story early on, their mission, vision, purpose. You know, we start as early as coming up with a name for a brand or a business. And we take it through the visual identity creation, the marketing planning, the strategy, right? That's sort of the, the full um, package. But then also sometimes people come to us and they already have an established brand and they're already doing great for themselves. And they might just need to understand how to, reach a specific demographic or cultural audiences or, you know, age group, or they might need help with their messaging and their communication. And they want to um, be more diverse and inclusive in, in the way they market and understand where there is untapped potential that we can help them reach through their marketing. So it really is a variety of, um, of ways that we can work, work with companies, but yeah. And so how is that different? Because I know that you, your your main focus really is that multicultural aspect, which is literally your life going back and forth yeah. and being multicultural yourself. And then through, I mean, being in two places, going here, there. And I know you also travel all over. So it's not like you're just from Germany and then you just come here. Yeah. Um, so how does that, how is that different though? I mean, this is these are selfish questions, right? Because I know like, I kind of want to know, like how is his marketing and culture, you know, uh, different in places like Germany, you know, cause you're, you now can, can help people globally, like whether they're from here, from there reaching a market, say in Germany versus reaching a mar market that's here. Yeah. So a lot of it is understanding the customer mindset and that consumer behavior. Right. And so growing up in Germany to middle Eastern parents, I have a really good balance of understanding those two different parts of the world Mm -hmm. in a very natural way. Right. So, and I think that's where marketing is, is really, it, it's different because you have to understand how to adapt and how to localize your efforts. So a lot of times you have, you know, for instance, when I was um, spending time, those two years back in Germany, I was working at L'Oreal for about six months and I was writing my master thesis with them. And a lot of what we focused on in our marketing, and this was product marketing for a hair care brand at the time, a lot of what we focused on was the marketing we were receiving from France at the time, because it was for Garnier Fructis, you know, those green mm -hmm. shampoo bottles. And we would receive the, the marketing or the creative from France, but it would have to be adapted to the German consumer and the mm -hmm. German market. And so understanding what is that customer looking for? What are their, what are their habits, right? I mean, with hair care is, well, what are the, the hairstyles and the hair types that we have in Germany versus France? And how do women care about their hair? And what are things that they, um, that, that's important to them, right? That's different for everybody in, in different territories, different you know, geographically. Mm -hmm. So focusing on a lot of that. And I think when you understand your customer in different markets and in different cultures, that is really key to doing good marketing and making sure that you're talking to them and not at them. Y'all, 
Does this sound familiar at all? Come on now. <laughs> oh, I love I love this and I love when people echo it from all kinds of different places too because I'm all, you know, when we're talking about creating wholesale bundles and people are creating products and putting them together for their customer. That is literally rule number 1 that I tell people all the time. So I love hearing you say that. Like it's all about understanding your customer. What do they want? What do they need? What motivates them? What motivates them to buy your product. It's because you're speaking a language that they understand. You're using text, you're using images that they relate to. And they say, oh yeah, I mean, I am a curly haired girl, right? So, and obviously you brought out your natural curls today too, which I yes. love. Um, <laughs> And I'm a curly girl, but my biggest problem is fighting frizz, right? I live in, you know, humid Michigan, which my, my Floridian friends are rolling their eyes right now because they're like, yeah, you don't know nothing about humidity until you live in the South. I get it. Um, but still, like, I, I care about that. Someone says you're going to have shiny, no frizz, like no buildup. These words are like, exactly. yes, give me that. Yes, yes, yes. So it's all about knowing mm -hmm. what your customer wants. And the thing there is multiculturally no matter if you live in America or Germany or wherever, we have different needs multiculturally as well, different wow. just differences. And so knowing the customer, what are you selling? If it's your brand and you're building a brand, what are you about? Are you relating to the people who you're trying to relate to? Because that makes wow. a difference. I mean, culturally and uh, geographically and demographically, we all have different differences. We shop for different products. We look for different brands to align with. I mean, if we're not seeing people that look like us and sound like us and talk like us we don't relate to that ad and we want nothing to do with it like oh that brand doesn't care about curly haired girls every single person a model in their in their commercial all has this straight sleek like yeah. beautifully black hair or blonde hair whatever it is and i'm like what about these can you help me with like show me like a frizz hair here and then like beautiful curls over here and i'm like where take my money right so yeah absolutely building that brand building a brand and a product and, and advertising and marketing around that message of i understand you i care wow. about you i care about your needs that's how you sell stuff right mm -hmm. so i love i love what you're doing with with the marketing there now i gotta ask you a question now is um, you know, with this all this journey and going back and forth and, you know, going to school, then working for someone else and then going back to school and then traveling again and then coming back to entrepreneurship. What did you really discover about yourself along the way? Now, something good and something that needed work. <laughs> you know, one of the biggest things for me was that I had to be more vulnerable. Mm -hmm becoming an entrepreneur because naturally I'm a very private person, but running a company, especially a marketing company, mm -hmm. you have to put parts of yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And I think I came to the realization when I decided to start my own business. And that's when I came back from Germany, sort of was a whole, you know, soul searching for months and months and months. What am I going to do with my life? And sort of ended up here. And that was a whole nother journey in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But going through that, I, I understood that if I want to start a business and I, I'm going to be the face of the business, I need to be vulnerable and I need to put parts of myself out there, um, you know, still where I feel comfortable. But I think that there's been a lot of growth in that and evolving in that um, by by following all of it. And I think that's where I've become sort of better over time. Well, I'm glad that you've become more vulnerable and put more of yourself in, into the world because I honestly think that that uh, I really feel it's a, it's hard for people and it's hard to yeah. be vulnerable. It's hard to be seen because what if they don't like what they see? What if I say something wrong? What if I get canceled? What if I mean you just like if you can't be too careful and it's easier to be to be honest and fair. It's really easy to just kind of keep quiet on the subjects we're not supposed to talk about you're not allowed to have a political opinion or you're not allowed to have a religious opinion or so just stay in the lines and stay in your yeah. lane and be quiet and you don't have to be vulnerable um and i'm not saying we're waving all of those flags everywhere either i just mean that like being vulnerable being honorable to your true self regardless of whether that's popular or whether that's well received um really takes a lot of courage and um you know you'd be surprised i always have um you know I actually have a something here that my mom gave me and it says you never know who you're inspiring and yes. I think the more that we are authentic and honest with ourselves good bad or otherwise I mean I 
I try to do best to be my full authentic self. And it's kind of like, take it or leave it. This is, mm-hmm. this is what you get. But um, at the same time, you never know how your words, how you're just showing up for yourself and being vulnerable inspires someone else to do the same. And we all have something to share. You know, you have been on a path that I've never been on. And so we can always learn from someone if we're willing to, to share and we're willing to listen. Totally. And, you know, I just tweeted something, I think it was yesterday or a few days ago. And I said, just because someone's not engaging in your content doesn't mean they're not watching. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing, right? You could be inspiring people that you don't even know about. They might never reach out and they might never tell you, but you just trust that everything you're putting out into the world is reciprocated in some form or shape, right? Yeah. And, you know, that's always been my mission. If I can help just one person, I even wrote, you know, talking about transitioning to this wonderful book that's coming out. I'm so excited about it. Um, Brand love, but like, well, like transitioning into that, writing my book is it talking about vulnerable, talk about being vulnerable, write a book and you will feel the deepest vulnerability that you can feel when you write a book, because it's a piece of your soul that you cannot take back or delete yes. out of the universe you write a book you publish it it's just out there oh, sure. out there and so whether or not you love it hate it whatever it is a piece of you that's now floating wherever and again i thought to myself if i write this book and it helps one person i've accomplished my goal and mm-hmm. honestly before it ever hit the market before it even sold a single copy before anything before it left my hands i got <laughs> i'm going to show you my <laughs> My trusty, rusty, marked up, beat up. That's what I do. For resale author copy, right? And when I first got this in my hand, I, first of all, I cried like a baby, oh. like a big baby. It was like, look at this, my book. But then I was like, I said, my goal was to inspire at least one person with this. Mm. The first time I held it, it in my hand, money. it was me. So I thought, you know what? I inspired myself, got goal accomplished. <laughs> I love it. Goal accomplished. If I can't, if I can't inspire myself with being having the courage to hit send, hit publish on that on that desktop there, that was definitely one of my jobs. I was like, I, I don't know, I can't undo this once it's done. Um, so vulnerability. So let's talk about your brand love and your book and how what made you decide to write this book? Why was this book necessary for the world? Yeah, so I had been talking and researching the topic of brand love for many, many years. And it sort of started going back to L'Oreal when I was there and working on my master thesis. And the topic at the time was focused around how can we relaunch a successful love brand, which was Garnier Fructis at the time, using the the concept of, of brand love. And so I was like, oh, this sounds really interesting. And I did all my research and I wrote the thesis and I was so inspired by uh, just the emotional journey in branding and in marketing and how we connect with people, essentially the same way we connect with brands, right? And so that's sort of been a tagline that I've carried through Blunda Collective. And so going back to that journey, I was really inspired to continue to research and educate myself on what brand love is. And so even though there's no real definition in a dictionary or in the market, even, um, I decided to create my own and it's featured in the beginning of the book. And it really is about this emotional connection between a brand and a consumer. And it's this long-term connection that we develop that is built on desire and affection and essentially results in brand loyalty and advocacy. And that really is brand love. And so you know, being inspired by this topic and then starting the company and working with different clients, I've always tried to weave in the concept of this emotion in your marketing. So it's culture meets emotion, essentially. And so over the years or the past few years, really, I started speaking publicly and nationally on this topic of brand love. And I hosted workshops and sort of was kind of like a focus group, if you will, right? With no intention of writing the book, actually, while I was doing all of that, I think looking back, it all sort of makes sense now of how this came together. But there was no intention of writing a book, especially on this topic at the time. I was doing, you know, marketing conferences nationally, speaking about the topic, all the feedback I received was top, the workshops were sold out, you know, so there was interest that I saw 
about this topic. And I felt like there was a gap in the market to really touch on brand love. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I decided to write it, and this is back in 2021, you know, I said, I've just researched this topic so much. I feel like I really need to do something bigger with it. And I started thinking about the book. And then one of my mentors um, at the time said, you know, I think you should write a book about this topic. And I was like, oh my God, I've, I've been thinking about this, right? Yeah. And so I started looking into self-publishing and I have a few friends that had self-published their books and I talked to them. They're like, self-publishing is the way to go. And so I was like, okay, did a little bit of research. And I was like, uh, not the right time to put this out. I just feel like I'm so busy with work. And this was like mm-hmm. mid 2021. And so I just sort of put the thought aside and I kid you not, Kristen, three to four months later, I get this email in my inbox from my now publisher. And it was my acquisitions editor saying, Hey, I saw you speak at, you know, this marketing conference about brand love. Have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> Three times a charm. I, I know. And I started doing research on the publisher and just sort of I'm like, is this legit? Like, there's no way this has been a thought of mine. And you know, there was definitely an intention to to do some of this. And I was like, yes, I absolutely have. I responded to her. And you know, we started um connecting. It was a few months back and forth, and I was weighing the options of, you know, do I go with this publisher or do I self-publish? And um, decided to do it with them and, and really happy that that I decided to do it that way. And so that was kind of the journey of, hey, let me write this book, but really to the topic, because it, it could have been a book about any other topic in marketing too, right? But that was the book where I felt like, where can I provide the most value where I also feel really comfortable in terms of what I can contribute? Mm. And so I had done those years and years of research and I had kept Excel sheets of different brands and examples and marketing initiatives that I had come across in different markets that sort of stuck with me and that I thought were really interesting and intriguing and inspiring. And so I used a lot of that research to then create this book and looking at the, looking at the market, of course, there there are books about brand love and they might just have different titles and, you know, focused on different elements of brand love. But I felt like there was a gap in the market in terms of intertwining it with multiculturalism, because we see that the brands really evoke emotions of their customers in order to create that brand loyalty. But we also see that 20 years from now, half of the U.S. population is going to be multicultural. I mean, the future is multicultural. So I was like, how do I bring these two worlds together? It's not just about emotion, but it's also just as much about culture and bringing out that human side in your brand. So that to me was really the key motivation to adding my voice and my perspective to the market. I absolutely love that. that. And love that you're so, no, it's fine. It's, it's, it's interesting, you know, because it's, it's something that as no matter what business you're in, you have to market. You're, it's not a, if you build it, they will come. Let's be real. It is the internet. Everybody yeah. has a podcast. Everybody has a book. Everybody has a, you know, whatever else it is, right? And so the point here is yeah. to really decide that you care enough about your customer. And not that I need to remind anyone who our customers are. The customers are the people who are putting money in our pocket so we can pay our bills, right? We are in business. We don't work for someone else who just gives us a paycheck. That's You don't have customers at that point. You have an employer, which is fine. I'm not dissing anybody as an employer, but as entrepreneurs, business owners, whether you're doing um, big marketing like you are, or you're doing product creation like we're doing and brand creation, we are still doing that. People will come back when they feel they got value from your brand. And I don't care if you're selling tennis yes. shoes or HDMI cords. It really does. It doesn't have to be sexy to be like, oh my gosh, this is the best brand. Yeah. If you think about it, we can name brands of non-sexy products that people aren't. Yeah, of course people are going to rave about their Air Jordans, whatever. Okay, fine. Or people are going to like, oh my gosh, my Lululemons or whatever. Okay, great. We all know these brands and that's fine. But what about that brand of something that you're like, you're talking about something basic, like literally this Kleenex, right? Kleenex is a brand. It's a brand that everybody, right. It's a a Kleenex is a brand. It's not just like, okay, you can buy, you know, 
facial tissue, but like, what is the brand when people are like, oh, hand me a Kleenex, right? There's something to that. There's something that people are loyal to, something that they know that it's either been plastered all over everywhere. But when you your customers really feel like this company cares about me, they relate to me, they know me, they're creating products that I love, they can't help but continue talking about those products or that service or whatever else. It just pours out of people. And so if you're building mm -hmm. that brand that, that reaches and you're forward thinking, that's what I love about this is, it, is forward thinking into the future is multicultural. We are a global international world now to where we have so much access to travel and um, you know communication now that we didn't have years and years ago that our cultures are shifting and changing and learning more about each other which means we have an opportunity mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs to sell and distribute and serve a multicultural environment globally i have customers yeah. that are international and don't speak english yet they come to me and say may i translate your course into um yeah into another language so I can teach my people how to use your system. I mean, these are things that are happening. And so yeah. it's such a beautiful thing for you to be able to, to kind of fill that gap and remind us that, you know, how, how our customers can fall in love with our brand and, and how we can reach them in a way that's, that's different than what everyone else is doing. So you, you guys, I can, uh, one more question. This is my favorite question. Um, <laughs> what what brought you the most joy in when writing the book? Cause I know it's hard. I know that writing a book is hard and well, that's the next question too. But like for, yeah. for real though, there is a specific, there's some sort of joy in writing a book. What was the most inspiring to you? So part of it, I'm not going to go into detail with that. I'll give you another answer, but part of it was definitely, definitely the vulnerability part, similar to what I had shared earlier from when you start a company, because like you said, you put out this piece of work into the world and you can never take it back. And so, you know, people can always take that off the shelf and read a little bit about, you know, your work and your thoughts and even just your stories. Um, I think that was definitely a part of it, but the biggest part was the limitless creativity that comes with writing a book. Mm -hmm. So really doing it from your own perspective, adding your own voice, sharing all of the stories you want to share. I felt like it really provided an opportunity for me to tell stories that otherwise wouldn't have get told, wouldn't have been told, um, but weave them in with relevant marketing information or brand information, right? And so that to me, I feel like I discovered another part of my own creativity um, of how I can express myself and just share that with the world. So that to me was really, really exciting throughout the process. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I'm, I've always been a writer and I, I hadn't written a book. It was my, my book journey was way back in 2015 when I went to a con conference and my, what I call, I call my, someone I looked up to in the industry that I, he was kind of the OG and was following him. And we went to this conference and he basically looked at me. He's like, and why don't you have a book? And I was like, that's a great question. I was literally like, <laughs> didn't know what to say. Cause he didn't say you should write a book. He's like, and why don't you have one? And it was kind of like, what am I supposed to say to that? I don't know, because I don't have the courage to write it or because I don't know what to say. I'm like, I knew what to say. I knew a lot of what to say. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. saying a lot. Um, so that was interesting because he had a couple of books by then and he was just kind of like, and why don't you do this? Because why not? And here's this. I mean, it was just kind of a challenge that it was like a challenge accepted. And I think the why not was, um, again, another meeting, like you said, you had these people coming from different places and mm -hmm. you should write a book and you should write a book. And um, as I was, actually started the process of maybe doing it on my own I went to another conference and, and the lady that helped that lady launch her book was standing behind me at lunch we started talking and she's like you absolutely have a book idea and we're working together and I ended up working with her as an editor um, but I think the why not was really a little bit of a push of courage it was why not because I've never written a book. I don't know how, you know, all, all the things you don't know how to do start popping into your head, right? It's just like, I don't know how to publish. I don't know how to organize all this information into a readable content. I don't know what to do. But you did it. Yeah. You figured it out, you know? That's right. And that's what entrepreneurs do. You know, you said something very early on in this interview that I wrote down because I was like, this is something I want to come back to and just like kind of close out with is you said you, you weren't an, an entrepreneur in the beginning. You worked with the music industry and you worked there for five years or, or so, but you, you realized during that time, you said you had a loyalty 
to growth. And it didn't matter if it was the company you worked for as growth or your own. That's kind of what I, I brought from that. It's like, I just had a loyalty to grow the company. You wanted to make it better. You wanted to make it stronger. You wanted to make it work. You figured out the problems. Those are all those markers of that entrepreneur. And what you added that you finally got blended collective with was the courage. You finally yeah. add, added the courage to the skill set you learned early on. And that really is that loyalty to growth. You care so much about uh, your clients and their growth and their impact in the world that you can't help but help them. You're committed to that. And I love that you turned that into entrepreneurship because some people give 30 years of their life being loyal to a company that would literally replace them in two seconds. So I love yeah. that you saw that and then you decided to have the courage to start Blended Collective. And now the world is better for it because now we all Aww. get to share in your knowledge and your expertise and your the beautiful way that you, that you put culture into everything that you do is so inspiring to me so i cannot wait uh to get and read brand love which is coming out july 25th right is the release yeah. right so july 25th in uh the us and canada and for everybody else around the world it's july 3rd so oh. less than a month yes oh my gosh july 3rd well, yeah. i'm so so excited to get the book you guys oh sorry that's my that's my, you better get off this and go to your next meeting timer. <laughs> See, I'm always setting timers for everything because I could go on and on. And of course with you, we could take up more than our time together. So uh, thank you so much for coming here. You guys get the book. The book is called Brand Love. This is Lydia Michael. And of course, go mommyincome.com forward slash brand love. The link is there. You don't even have to remember anything else. That's where you go. You get the book, make sure. And of course, the most important thing that you can do supporting an author is what? Leave a review. Leave a review. <laughs> Gosh, yes. Leave a review. I don't care if it's three sentences or three paragraphs. It doesn't have to be a five star. I mean, of course, as authors, we want five star reviews, um, but we're not really allowed to ask for that. So, you know, just put your heart and soul into it. And I know it's going to be five stars. If you buy a book, leave a review. I don't care if it's good or if yeah, it's, you hate it, point. leave it. But leave a review. Your authors really, really need that. It, it shows Amazon. It shows Barnes and Noble. It shows wherever. It shows the publishers people care about this book and they're willing to take 30 seconds to write two sentences so when you buy when you buy brand love um you're going to leave a review for lydia and let her know your feedback on the book what your biggest takeaway was and um of course i cannot wait to get my copy and hopefully a signed one um when you have some sort of book signing local which of course i'll announce if she comes local she's local here in michigan detroit area and yes so be happy to see you in person again soon and again you guys brand love uh lydia michael thank you so much for being here absolutely thank you for having me kristen this was awesome absolutely y'all you could be anywhere else doing any other thing i don't take that for granted thank you for listening to the amazon files podcast mommyincome.com forward slash brand love go get the book and um we'll see you same time same place next week on the amazon files